came ready to receive today? Who came ready to be changed today? Is change important? Is perspective important? How many know that, I'm not even going to ask it that way, I'm just going to say, I think we all know, that every single person living on the planet, or let's bring it home, every single person in this room right now, if, if for every statement I make, every person has a little bit different perspective of that statement. When I say we're receiving tithe and offering, as I said a moment ago, one person has a heart that understands what the tithe and offering is in the kingdom of God. Another person questions why. When I say that there are two gospels, one person immediately goes to there's only one gospel, and then the other person says there is one gospel, but I understand the perspective. When we say we're having a lip sync battle, one person hears embarrassment, another person hears hilarious, and another person hears opportunity. I'm about to show them what I'm capable of doing. And we will let you know. But for every person, for every person, for every one that is under the sound of my voice, whatever is said, whether I say it or someone else says it, each of us hold in ourselves our own perspective about what was just spoken. Today, I really, really, really want to share with you and hope that I can, by the end of this message, deliver to you what Holy Spirit has delivered to me. I hope that by the end of this message, that you will hear what I heard as he began to release to me this message about two Gospels. I hope that in all of us, there is a burning want and hope for all mankind to be born again. Let me say it again. I hope that in every single one of us that is under the sound of my voice today, that there is a burning want and hope for all of mankind to be born again. There are so many ways that Christ is described throughout Scripture. There's so many ways Christ is described in society, in our lives. But the one way that says it, says it all is what He called being born again. So many ways to define our relationship with Him, but there is one way that He defines better than all, and that is being born again. I shared a story this morning with the team before we came out about a time in my life when I had, was newly saved. I had not been a believer very long. I was saved in 1985. And when I, not long after I got saved, I went to college up in Waxahachie, Texas, and I worked while I was in school. I was working at this very large company called Central Freight Lines. And what I did for Central Freight Lines was I unloaded their semi-trucks. So I would go after college, uh, was, and my day was over. I would immediately drive over to, to uh, the, the, the hub where all the semis were. There were 587 hubs on that. It was, at the time, it was the largest uh, hub in the United States. I don't know if it still is. But you would go there and you could get lost in all the ways you could go. But I would get to this place, Central Freight Lines, and I would find out where my assignment was and I would go to my trailer and I would unload that trailer. What I loved to get was the trailers that were full of paper towel and toilet paper boxes. <laughs> Love those trailers because, Tim, you can identify. Man, you could empty that thing in like an hour. What I hated was when I got to one that was full of vitamins and minerals and little bitty boxes that are this big and they're stacked by the thousands in that trailer. But in my time working there, whether it was hot or cold, and Dallas can be the, both worlds, it could be hell and it can be <laughs> the Arctic all at the same time. And we would be in the back of that and in one of these moments, one of these seasons, I was working next to a guy that was in the trailer beside me. I don't remember his name today, but um, I remember that in the process of it, we both ended up in the break room at the same time. And we were getting to know one another, just chatting, just, just chatting. And in that chat, somehow faith came up. Jesus came up. The gospel came up. And I don't know if he asked me if I was a believer or if I asked him. I have no idea. You get 30 minutes, so, you know, you just you get to the point usually. And during that time, I said to him when he explained to me that he too was in college in Dallas, outside of Dallas, but he was at a, ba a Baptist college. And, he, and I was not at a Baptist college. I was at a 
not Baptist college. And, and I said to him, because of what I had learned about Baptist or what I had been taught about Baptist was two different versions. And one is that they are very passionate. And again, this is a season in my life that's how, how many years ago, 1985, almost 40 years ago, right? Almost 40 years ago. Oh my goodness, that's painful. <laughs> but, um, but sitting there with him, what I, only, I could only ask what I knew. So I said to him, I said, you know, I've heard that Baptists believe that once you're saved, you're always saved. Can you explain that to me? Because we believe that you can backslide. You know, and that's sort of like the woman at the well in Christ. You believe this, but we believe this. And I said, so you believe, you Baptists believe like they were a sinful race. And you Baptists believe that once saved, always saved. And, and he said, well, let me tell you what that really means. What that means is we believe that if you are genuinely saved, if you come to the place where, if a person comes to a place where they have genuinely come to know Christ, there is no chance they will ever walk away. The only people that could walk away from Christ are those who re really never knew Christ. Man, that was profound to me. And then I was just mute. <laughs> I was just, I thought, I believe that too, but I'm not Baptist. But I believe that too. And I got saved on July the 8th, 1985. And when I got saved on that Sunday, I knew when I was walking to my car out of that choir room of that church in Houston, Texas, I knew when I was on my way to my vehicle and I was getting ready to go home, there would never be a, a turning back for Steve Parker. When I got saved, it was so real to me, and it was almost powerless, if I can use that word. It, it was powerful in the fact that I was a born-again person, but it was powerless in the sense that I didn't feel anything special. There was no, whoa, I'm a brand new man. There was no running out and about and telling everybody I knew that, man, suddenly I'm a believer, although I did tell people, but there was no need to just go find everybody in the street and shake them up and tell them, I got saved tonight. There just wasn't any fireworks when I got saved. There was just this knowing. I'm different. There was this knowing in me that suddenly I began to recognize that there were things that moments before I had a want to. That suddenly... I had no desire to be a part of. There's no explaining that except for to say a heart that was in tune to unrighteousness and was very keen and could easily identify with what was unrighteous suddenly was transformed to a heart that did not identify with unrighteousness but was repulsed by it was offended by it and was now in tune to a righteousness, a passion to do what is right that I had not known before. Amen. And I never looked back. That was all those years ago and never, no matter what has happened in my life from 1985 until now, there has not ever been a single moment in time and there have been moments when it would have been easy to say, I quit. I give up. It's just not worth God, where are you? There would have been moments it would have been easy to say that, but never, whether it was through the loss of our son, whether it was through the challenges that my wife and I faced that you are even unaware of, no matter what it was as we went through, there was never one time that my wife and I or myself alone ever said, you know, I'm just not sure it's worth it. I'm done. And I'm going to tell you why. Because when I came to know Christ, when he introduced himself, I didn't introduce myself to him. He introduced himself to me. And when he came in, all he did was invite me to become one with him, to be born again. And when he invited me to be born again, there was this thing that rose up in me, something that was beginning to change in me. There was a metamorphosis that was taking place in Steve Parker that I could not resist. It was something I didn't even have to work for. Suddenly, I began to become passionate 
passionate about what will honor God. And there has never been a looking back. For those of us who are born again today, we have a responsibility to lead others to Jesus Christ as though their lives depend on it. Because they do. When that night that you know the story about, and you could tell it better than me, but that night that I got saved and I came to Christ and I repented of the man that I was, I, I wouldn't have even called it sin because I, I didn't know what part was sin and what part was me and what part was... I just didn't matter to me. That was, those were words that were irrelevant. What I needed to know was there's a God that loved me and He wants to change my life. That's all that really mattered to me. He wants to change my life. You call it sin. You can call it rebellion. You can call it whatever you want to. I could care less. All I know is who I was is not who he liked. And I wanted to become the one he loved. And he created to be. So when I went and I walked out of that place, when I first went down to receive Christ and I walked down to the altar, this is before I had actually received him, the minister that was there that night, called everyone down. I went down and as I'm watching people across the room and he's laying hands on them, some of them were falling, which was, I I didn't understand it. It scared me, intimidated me. I didn't want to fall. I didn't want to do what they were doing. So we got about three people away from me and I turned around and I ran out of that. I mean, I got out of that building as fast as I could. It was a big church too. And I got out of that building as fast as I could and I went to my car and I was opening my car door and right behind me, I heard this voice say, can I help you? Are you okay? And I said, you know, I just don't, I don't, what in the world was going on in there? And it was a youth pastor in that church. And he said, you know, if you'll give me just a few moments, would you come back in the building with me? And let me do the best that I can to explain what just happened. And if you don't get it, you don't want anything to do with this. If you don't want anything to do with what we believe is Christ, if you don't want anything to do it, you can get back in your car and you can drive away. But if you'll just give me just a few minutes. And I said, Sure. And I went back in there to that choir room and then that's when he began to talk to me about Christ and about what the, what the anointing does and about being born again. And he even tried to explain to me about all the people that fell out and the, people that, and the things that were happening around me. And it, but really, that stuff was irrelevant to me. I didn't care if, if a thousand people fell. or I didn't care if they levitated. It would have been irrelevant to me because all I knew at that moment was when he was talking to me about Christ, something, there was a sound resonating in me. And I prayed and I received Christ that day. But I'm going to tell you what was important about this story is the youth pastor. He recognized that I'm a a man who was born again and I have a responsibility to lead this man or give this man opportunity to know Jesus Christ. And I'm going to go track him down as though his life depends on it. As though that Steve Parker's life depends on it because it does. What's coming for that man, Steve Parker, that I don't even know yet. When Steve Weaver chased me down, to that car and asked me to come back in. He knew the significance of the moment. He did not know that I'd be standing before you on this date, May the 29th, 2022, preaching the gospel that he shared with me. He had no idea. He could have never known that. Could have never known. But he knew that he could not let the moment be lost. Because somehow he pushed aside, well, if he doesn't want it, I'm not going to make it go for it. There was something in him that said, there are people out there that don't know what I know. And for me to keep the secret is a violation of the gospel itself. I want to read with you this morning. If you would, please turn with me to John chapter 3. The book of John chapter 3. And again, I want to talk about these two gospels. John chapter 3 verse 1 starts like this, says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to, to Jesus by night and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered him and he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him what all of us would have said. He said, how can a man be born when he's old? He's already born. Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said to him, he said, truly, truly, I say to you. Truly, when he says that, that means believe me, believe me. Can I have your attention? 
I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, unless one is born of flesh and Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh, it is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit, it is Spirit. And then he said this interesting statement. He said, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. (laughs) Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Let's break down this little passage here for a moment. What, What did he mean when he said to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, I just gave you a lot of information and what I don't want you to do is get caught up in the you must be born again. He said, don't be shaken by that. Don't be shaken because I use terms that you don't understand. What I, want you to, what I want you to understand, Nicodemus, is that I have come to you to set you free. And if you try to get, or you do get caught up in all the verbiage, and you do get caught up in the terminology, you're going to get lost. You're going to be confused. He said, but what I'm bringing to you is something that is available to every single person that will receive me. And what I'm bringing to you is this thing called salvation. And it is true you must be born again, but I only use that statement, being born again, just so that you will understand with your natural man what it means to become one with Christ. I could have used any, any term. In fact, Christ could have inserted anything. You don't have to be born again. You could, be, you could appear. You could whatever. You could reappear. You could be remodeled. He could have called it remodeled. You must be remodeled. He could have called it anything, but he was using something that Nicodemus could identify with. And Nicodemus said, how in the world can this guy, this old dude, this guy that is already living, enter again into my mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus said to him, he said, Nicodemus, you're missing the point. This isn't about getting back into your mama's womb. This is all about you being a transformed man. And if you want to know me, Nicodemus, now hear me, church. If you want to know me, Nicodemus, if you want to walk with me and you want to have what I have and you want to understand what I understand, if you want to see the kingdom of God, if you want to see it and witness the glory of God working in your life, if you will receive me, I will change you, not because I insert you back into your mother's womb. I will change you because revelation will begin to come to you. Understand, you will begin to love what I love, and you will begin to hate what I hate. That's born again, Nicodemus. It's when you recognize that the man that came out of the womb can be transformed into a man who is born by the Spirit. Coming to Christ allows us to see What is not visible without Him, which is the kingdom of God. I believe that when I refer back to that man at Central Freight Lines that I had a lunch with or we took a break together, I believe this about that that man, that he saw the kingdom of God. And I believe that I saw the kingdom of God. But in what he said to me, it helped me understand that people who do backslide have yet to really see, and I use that word backslide very loosely, they have yet to really see the kingdom of God. Because I'm convinced when there is an appearing, there will never be a disappearing. You need to hear me. I am convinced that when there is an appearing, there will never be a disappearing. God does not come and go on a whim. He doesn't come to you because you have done everything right. And He doesn't search you out only because you have done everything wrong. He searches you out and appears to you because You were accounted to Him the moment He breathed breath into your nostrils. Every man and every woman. When we come to Christ, it allows us to literally see what we could not see when we did not have Him. Before I knew Him, as I witnessed people, I knew people in the church, I'd been taken to church. There were times that 
People I knew would invite me to say the sinner's prayer with them before that monumental day when I understood it. But there were times they would invite me to say the sinner's prayer and I would repeat it after them, but for many different reasons. One, I would repeat it so they'd leave me alone. Another reason was I'd repeat it because they had convinced me that maybe there was magic in it. But there was never any power in it until the day of His appearing. And on the day of His appearing to me, suddenly there was a power that went with it. If I have to convince somebody to come to know Christ, if there is a need for me to say to them, please, or to beg them, then plead with them to come, they will not come and last. But if I can introduce them to the glory of God, if I can introduce someone to the miraculous power of the Holy Ghost, if I can enter and be a testimony and be a witness of the authority and the anointing and the power of God and how it's changed my life, if I can be a witness to that and a demonstration to that, they will come and they will recognize the appearance of God when He shows up. You know, I believe that to see the kingdom of God is to really get a hold of His hopes for you. If I can't see the kingdom of God, it's easy for me to question, why should I serve Him? If I don't see the kingdom of God, it's easy for me to question, why should I go to church on Sunday morning? If I can't see the kingdom of God and see the activity within it, because the kingdom of God is not a place of void. It is a place of power. It is a place of anointing. It is a place where change happens. It is a place where the miraculous happens. It is a place where relationships are born. It is a place where healing takes place. It is a place where eyes see and where ears hear and where the lame man walks. It is a place where the, where the man who couldn't walk before begins to leap and to dance and to rejoice and celebrate that indeed God is God. There's not another. It is that kind of place. And when someone peers into the kingdom of God and they see the power and the anointing of Christ at work in the kingdom of God, making a place for the sons and daughters that He is wooing to them, when they can witness what is going on inside the kingdom of God, there is an urgency. There is an urgency. There is an urgency to rise up and come to the door and say, I repent. I want to enter in. I have to come into that place because I see the hand of God at work in that place. The incredible news is when you peer into the kingdom of God and you have a visit when there is an appearing of God before you and He lets you see even for a moment the possibilities. And you believe even for a moment the potential. When you come to the door And you knock. There's no one opening a little peephole and saying, we're closed. No one opening that little peephole and saying, we don't accept your kind. No one opening that peephole looking you up and down to find out whether or not you're worthy. No one opening that little peephole trying to sort you out, figure you out, and trying to judge you by what you've done in the past. The person that comes, when you knock on that door, there is no peephole. That door swings open wide. And there is a real Jesus Christ, a real Savior standing on the other side of that door saying, whosoever will, if you can receive me, what you have seen a glimpse of, you are about to live in. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a message of life for everyone who will receive it. But what about those who won't? Again, I want to tell you a story. I don't know that I've ever shared this story. It's not a, I don't even know why I said it that way because it's not like a sad story. But I was in the fifth grade and I knew nothing about the kingdom of God. I mean, zero other than what I saw. But I was a really good parrot and I could repeat everything I'd heard. It was my best acting gig. (laughs) But strangely, as I said to you before, when I was six years old, I got my first Bible. When I could read, I began to read the Bible five verses every single night until I read it all the way through several times. Even though I did not personally have a relationship with Jesus Christ, there was something about that. I always heard his voice. I I, I, I couldn't identify it that way at that age. 
But I knew there was a longing in me for more. I'd watched family members who knew him. I'd watched them serve him. I'd watched the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'd seen the same things that you saw. But there was a longing in me. And I remember in the fifth grade, I was sitting in this particular uh, school. It was Armstrong Middle School. And as I was sitting in that, uh, started at fifth grade. And as I was sitting in, this, in my homeroom, it was a little pit. And uh, it was really cool, actually. It was um, a big a pit that sunk into the floor, and that was our homeroom. And we started every day in that little pit. And I was sitting there in that pit, and I, was, and I met a, a new fellow, and I remember his name still. I don't know why I remember it, but it just came to me. His name was Jeff Latchaw. And I was sitting with this, this person, and I met him, and, and uh, hey, I'm Steve. Hey, I'm Jeff. And, you know, we got the same classes together. Let's look at our schedule. You know, just doing those kinds of things. And, and, um, and in that conversation that we had, he asked me if I went to church anywhere. This is a little dude, you know, we're 10 years old. He said, do you go to church anywhere? And I said, no, no, do you? Yeah, I do. And he started telling me about his church. And here's the funny thing about that story. Maybe I have shared this before, but he starts telling me about his church and he starts telling me about what he believed. And as he's telling me about what he believed, and I said, well, Jeff, I, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm already, I'm, I'm 10 years old. I'm already trying, I'm trying to sort it out <laughs> for this guy. And I said, Jeff, you know, I don't remember what it was, but I begin to interact with him, dialogue with him about what he had believed. And, and, and I said, I, I, what I do know is that Jesus loves us. I know he loves us. I didn't know anything about that. I didn't even know what that really meant. I, I didn't get it. But I knew it was important that Jeff was concerned. It bothered me because he was concerned about all the things they did do and didn't do. And I can see the whole conversation as though I'm living in another realm watching it occur right now. And me just responding to him and saying, it's, it's not about that. It's just he loves us, man. He loves us. I can never do all that, Jeff. I can't do all those things. I'm 10 years old, dude. You don't do them either. You know, I come to find out that was all true. He didn't. But the gospel is a message of life for everyone who will receive it. But what about those who don't receive it? See, I believe that the gospel is a message of life to those. And we're going to read in Mark in just a moment. But I believe that the gospel is a message of life to those who receive it with their eyes wide open. I think the danger of trying to receive the gospel through doctrine is that doctrine will always let us down. But for those who receive the gospel of Jesus Christ by truth and because there is an appearing, when He shows up, don't close your eyes. Listen to me. When He shows up to you, don't close your eyes. Don't say, I can't accept who I see because He doesn't line up with my Catholic theology. He doesn't line up with my Baptist theology. He doesn't line up with my Pentecostal theology. He doesn't line up this that I'm seeing. doesn't line up with my whatever theology. Fooey on all of that. When He, when there is an appearing, does He line up with your heart? Is there a calling out to you? Mark chapter 16, beginning with verse 14, reads like this. says, Afterward, Christ appeared to the eleven disciples themselves as they were reclining at table, and He rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. We covered a little bit of this last week. Because they had not believed those who saw Him after He had risen. And He said to them, I want you to go into all of the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. This again, I've got to rephrase again what I said last week, just so that you can get a hold of this. I'm not going to hang on there. We're going to move along because I want to get to the next part. But I love that here in this passage in Mark, and also in all of the Gospels, this is, there's a reference to this. But here in this passage, I love that uh, Christ is saying to the disciples, when I came to you, when I showed up to you, you had hard hearts and you did not believe. And this is what I want you to do because of that. I want you to go into all the world and preach the Gospel. Immediately following that, he says, why did you not believe? What was your problem? What, what was going on? So this is what I want you to do. Get your honeys out there and go preach the Gospel. Well, wait a minute, you just said we don't believe we have hard hearts. Well, just go preach the gospel. And, and the more you talk, speak the gospel, the more it's going to change you. When you start talking about the gospel more than you're talking about everything else, more than you're talking about gas prices, more than you're talking about Biden or Trump or whoever it is you talk about, more than you're talking about race or inequalities, or wars, 
You start talking the gospel and you start speaking the gospel and you, you start recognizing, you know what, in the middle of all of this, God is doing something in my life and I'm going to talk about that. You start doing that suddenly. Whatever hard heart might have existed, whatever disbelief might have been there, man, he can transform that. That's just a rephrasing. But he says, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. And then he says this profoundly, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. This is the two gospels. He said, the first gospel is to the one who believes and he who believes and is baptized will be saved. But the second gospel is this, whoever does not believe will be condemned. Same gospel perceived two different ways. There is one who hears the gospel and who enters into it. There is an appearing. There is another one who hears the gospel and runs from it because it doesn't line up with everything they thought that they were created to be. Two gospels. There's a gospel of salvation and there's a gospel of condemnation. Let me build you up here with what we're going to say here in just a second. When the gospel is preached, those hearing must decide how they will respond to it. Same is true for every person under the sound of my voice today. Those of you watching online, Whenever the gospel is preached, I'm releasing to you today what Holy Spirit gave to me. This is a gospel. I am preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And every single person under the sound of my voice is making a decision today, even if it is not a conscious one. You are making either a conscious or subconscious decision to either believe the gospel that you are hearing, to accept it, to receive it, and let it change you, or you are making a conscious decision or subconscious decision to reject what you are hearing today and to continue being and doing exactly what you've always done and been. Every single person in here, you are left with no choice except for to make a decision that you will receive it or you will reject it. Nobody has the power to deny one of those choices. It's amazing, isn't it? You did not know when you came to the rock this morning that you would find yourself deciding whether you were going to receive when the appearing came or you were going to reject. You did not know. But every single person, because of what I'm saying today, this morning, has, has, has to make a decision. I'm receiving this gospel, and I'm believing it unto life, or I am going to reject this gospel and continue to be who I am and not receive it at all. Every single person. He said, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. What does he mean by that? What does he mean by that? Now, I understand that many... I don't want to get into a doctrinal debate with anybody. And I know there are some doctrines that believe you're not actually saved until you're baptized in water. I'm not going to get into all that. If that's where your peace is, then so be it. We will get you baptized. But I can tell you, I believe it's important for water baptism that it's important. But that is not at all what this reference is. This has nothing to do with water. This has everything to do with this. I'm going to read it exactly like its original intent. Written, this is written in the Greek. Let me tell you exactly what this means. Whoever believes and is baptized into Christ will be saved. Not into water. Water never saved anybody. I believe water baptism is important. It symbolizes that a change has taken place. It lets the world know what happened on the inside. I want to show you on the outside. I want you to see with your eyes what you cannot see inside of me. What it means is whoever believes and is baptized into Christ. Everybody say, into Christ. Christ. No, we need to get that this morning. Say it with me this way. Everybody say this. Whoever believes believes and is baptized baptized into into Christ. will be saved. saved. Oh, me, oh, my. That is powerful. And if you can lay hold of that, coming to Christ isn't about showing up on Sunday morning. Salvation isn't Sunday morning church. I'm not a better Christian because I come to church. I might be a better attendee. I might be a better member. But I am not a better Christian. I am not a better believer just because I show up at church. I believe we all should show up on Sunday morning. I believe we should come together. I believe it should be important. But, and it will be important to those who are baptized into Christ. Not simply baptized into a thought or an idea. Not simply acquainted with the Christ they're supposed to be baptized into. There are so many people under the sound of my voice right now on that door into the kingdom, that vast kingdom we talked about just a few moments ago. There are some standing on the other side of the door yet to knock. They're measuring it up. 
Is this really where I want to go? Because what happens is while one eye is on the door to the promise, another eye is on my door to my past. One eye is on what can be, but the other eye is stuck on what is. And there's a fear. If I enter in through that door, I have to leave all this. Can I tell you, Scripture is very clear. He said, sacrifice your sacrifices and your offerings I do not desire. But it is an obedient heart I am looking for. It is one who will be received and accept himself and believe himself to be a son. He said, if you come through this door, you think that all those things that are behind you are so important to you right now because you're standing in the middle of that moment. But when you stand in the middle of the moment that you were destined to be in, when you are baptized into Christ and you become one with Christ, you become that true heir with Christ. When you are joined to Christ, it's not an idea, but it is a life. It is a choice. It is a decision. You won't even remember those things. They will no longer matter to you. But what will matter to you is laying hold of the horns of the altar of God and saying, show me. I'm telling you, I'm preaching a gospel to you today that will change your life. I don't care where you've come from. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've walked out or what you're walking out. It doesn't matter. What matters is this gospel today is coming to you to change your life. It's coming to you to cause you to rise up and get on your feet. It's coming to you to cause you to lift up your head and put your shoulders back and throw your chest out. It's coming to you to say to you it is time that you rise up and be the son or the daughter that you were born to be and stop sitting back and watching everybody else enjoy the blessings of sonship. It's time for you and you and you and you. Every man, every woman in this house. So to be baptized is to become one with Christ in want and in passion. Man, Man, when I got saved, I use that word loosely because we're being saved every day. Born again is a safe word because it is the genesis of our relationship with Christ. But salvation is the ongoing relationship with Christ. So when I was born again... When I walked out of that place and I went to my house and I went and I told my cousin and you've heard me tell the story. I don't want to tell all the details. But I went and told them and I said, man, I, I got saved tonight. It, I didn't, like I said, there were no fireworks or anything going off. There were no bombs in the air. I didn't leave there and feel like I was floating across Houston getting home. I actually had to drive my car. I didn't transport. And I drove to 9210 Colindale. And I pulled up in the drive, driveway. And when I pulled up in that driveway, my cousin, my aunt, they lived next door to us and my family lived there. And I went in and I told my family, I said, I, I got saved tonight. There were reactions to that that's irrelevant now. But I said, I, I got saved tonight. And that's about how I said it. <laughs> that's about how I said it. I didn't say, I got saved. <laughs> Jesus changed me. There were no tears. There was no emotion. There wasn't. It was just a miracle. It was just a profound miracle. I was a born again man. I didn't even know how to define it, how to describe it. I just knew the guy you knew when he left tonight at six o'clock is somehow not the same guy that has come home at nine. I got saved and I went next door and I found my cousin who I had begged to go with me to church that night. And I went and I said, Rick, you won't believe what happened tonight. And he said, what? I said, man, I got saved. He said, what? I got saved. You know what his response was? His thought was, his verbalization was, he immediately began to recite all the things we would never do again together. There was no, oh, Steve, yeah, that's awesome. He began to recite all the things that we would never do again together. He began to tell me why that's going to hurt our relationship. He began to tell me why we couldn't it just, it's irrelevant, but things. We could not do those things anymore. And in my mind, as he's saying those to me, this is a true story. As he's saying those to me, every time he would run off a, a bullet point of what we would never be able to do anymore, somehow inside of me, there was this sense of, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I'm not going to do that anymore. That's awesome. 
what? I'm not going there anymore. <laughs> I wasn't saying that to him. I was just standing there listening to him, just confounded by the fact that he wasn't happy that I wanted to be a good person. <laughs> Two weeks later, he was dead. Murdered in downtown Houston. I don't know whether or not I would have been there with Rick. It's likely. Because Rick and I were together 24-7. We worked together. We played together. We, we just, everything together. Well, when I was baptized into Christ that night, I would have never defined it that way in the same way some of you would not. But man, I was baptized into Christ. When I came to know Him, when I was introduced to Him, I said, I want everything in you. And I don't know if you're full of water. If you're full of water, I'm going to swim all around who you are. If you're full of sand, I'm going to dig and I'm going to discover everywhere you are. If you are a mountain inside of you, I'm going to explore every trail. If you're snow, I'm going to ski wherever you are and whatever you are. All I know is I am going to be one with you. No matter what this one thinks, no matter what that one thinks, no matter what pulls on me here or pulls on me there, all I know is it's not about what I used to believe. It's not about what I was a part of. It is about what I am a part of today. And I have been baptized into Christ. And then what is saved? To be saved is to continue to receive the promise of eternal life. It is to continue to receive the promise of eternal life. Then he said this. He said, but whoever does not believe. This is what's good for those who believe. But whoever does not believe and is not baptized into Christ will be condemned. Condemnation gets a bad rap, especially in the Christian world, because condemnation from the Christian standpoint is when somebody is pointing their finger at someone and saying, you're going to hell, or you're going whatever, or this is bad, or you're not going to get this, or that blessing is going to be withheld from you. Or, that's condemnation in the, in, the, in the Christian world, in the church world today, or even in the secular world. When we think of condemnation, we think of somebody with their finger being pointed at them, condemning them, and, and saying to them, this is what's going to be withheld from you, this is what's going to be held. It requires no, no talking at all. Condemnation never is a finger pointed at us. Condemnation comes upon any of us that receive condemnation. We bring it upon ourselves simply by ignoring the power that came to rele release us from that condemnation. Are you hearing me? I'm going to make, make sense here. He said, whoever does not believe, whoever is not baptized into Christ, will be condemned because there is no baptism. Anything outside of the kingdom of God is condemnation. This is what we must understand. Condemnation isn't one thing or two things or a finger being pointed at someone in judgment. Condemnation is whatever is found outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Not having a relationship with Jesus Christ in and of itself is condemnation. Do you understand that? Condemnation is a lack of evidence of baptism into Christ, eternal consequence, and the absence of God and His blessings. That's condemnation. So when He said, whoever does not believe, whoever is not baptized into, my, into Himself, He is condemned already. Whoever does believe and is baptized into Christ, he will be saved. But whoever does not, he will be condemned. The condemnation isn't because God is up there looking for a way to make life hell for those who do not receive Jesus Christ. In fact, he didn't have to design that. In fact, prior to rebellion, there was no hell. God did not design hell at all. Read in the story of creation. It was not his intention for a hell to exist. 
But where there was rebellion, and Lucifer rose up, there was this place of hell created to hold him and those who follow him and those who deny Christ. But hell is not a place that is literal in the sense that, please don't get mad at me because what I'm saying does not line up with maybe what your previous doctrine is. Hell is not a physical place where someone is going to go because they denied Christ and there is these literal flames of fire and they live there for eternity. I want to tell you what hell is in the true interpretation of the Hebrew and the Greek. It is the anywhere you are where the absence of God is. The reason Christians and people and those who don't know God today find it easy not to worry about hell is because they think it's this place that is mystical, that is in the far off and far beyond. Hell is not somewhere in the distant. There are people walking around us today that are weeping and wailing, gnashing their teeth, trying to figure out how they're going to get to tomorrow. Because there's no God present in them. They are in hell right now. In every sense of the word, the gospel was not sent to condemn, but it was sent to save. In fact, the gospel actually never has condemned a single person. Again, any condemnation within any of us Anything that we receive as condemnation is the response to a rejection of truth. So there's two Gospels. I'm using that loosely again. I want to make sure that's clear. There is the Gospel of salvation. And there is the Gospel of condemnation. There is the truth of Christ, of salvation. And there is the truth that without Christ, condemnation rules. Condemnation sets in anywhere there is the absence of God. Do you hear me today? To receive the gospel of salvation is to be born again. Very simply put, to reject it is to be condemned. What can we do to show others that Jesus Christ is not an idea, but is a Savior? I'm going to live in Him. I'm going to speak of Him. I'm going to testify Him. And I'm going to be passionate about who and what He loves. And I'm going to reject everything He doesn't. I'm going to be passionate and I am going to embrace everything that he loves. And I am going to reject everything he doesn't. So where does that leave us in this room today? Where does that leave us online this morning? If you're watching, if you're listening, if you're hearing this morning, you're hearing this. You're hearing the story of this preacher then every sense of the word loves God with all of my heart, all of my soul, everything that's in me. In my loving of God, in my being baptized into Christ, in, that, in this life where I have been baptized into Him, I want what He wants, I love what He loves, I hate what He hates. In that, that doesn't mean I don't have moments that are difficult, moments that are rough, but I never live under the condemnation that I'm separated from Him. Because I've been baptized in Him. I never live under the thought that He has separated Himself from me. Because I'm baptized into Him. And when one thing is baptized into another, you can never separate those things again. When it is truly baptized, when one thing is baptized into another, you can never separate that again. I'm telling you, in this room today, there are people that have believe Christ you believe the message of Christ 
You believe in salvation. You believe in being born again. You believe these things. You believe in what you've heard, but you have never been baptized into Christ. You've never come to the place where everything in you burns with this unsatiable desire to lay hold of what He lays hold of and to let go of what He does not touch. There are people watching online today, everything in you, you want to honor Him, you want to be right, you want to, you want to walk with Him, you want to be, as I described today, you want to be baptized into Him, everything in you, you want to, you want to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that He is your Lord, He is your Savior, you are redeemed by Him, you, everything in you wants to know that, but there's something in you that still struggles to let go of what was, I want to tell you today, if you will, literally, if you will let go. And I'm telling everybody today, if you're hearing me, if you will let go. Stop hanging on to what condemns you. And lay hold of what will save you. I've said it before, I'm saying it again. If I had the ability... Now, and let me, before I do that, let me give a disclaimer. I'm not suggesting that no one loves God like I do. But no, I don't... <laughs> I'm not suggesting that when I tell this story. What I am suggesting is I love God with every fiber in my being. And I've told this before. I've said if I could take people and I could grab them by the shoulders and I could push them up against the wall and I could be aggressive even for just one moment and I could look into their eyes and I could say to them, if you only knew God like I know God. You would no longer do what you're doing. You would not be in those places you're going to. You would not talk about the things you're talking about. You would live differently if you only knew God like I know God. I can't do that. It's not up to me to cram God down anyone's throat. But it is up to me to go, Steve, therefore, into all the world. And preach the gospel of salvation. Preach the gospel of the kingdom. And for everyone who hears, they will be saved. They will be born again. 